So as uh, Lorcan mentioned earlier uh, this afternoon, we're in the midst of a renaissance or a minor explosion in interest in ethnography and libraries. And many libraries have recently undertaken some type of ethnographic study of their library or their library users. Um, and this interest, I think, really goes uh, back further than the last five to 10 years when we've noticed this real uptick um, back all the way to, to the 80s um, and early 90s. And even by the mid 1990s, there was a long multi-year argument in Library Quarterly about how librarians were already getting anthropology wrong. <laughs> so one of the things I'm really interested in is why libraries are suddenly at the center of this move towards using ethnography as a way to understand students, faculty members, and our universities uh, more generally. And my hope with this presentation is that I can both contextualize a little bit of the history of this mo movement um, and also make an argument for why these methods can be particularly effective for us as we're working in our libraries and in our universities. So libraries are probably not the first thing that most people think about when they hear the word ethnography. A lot of people picture something like this, um, being sat down in a on a tropical island close to a native village um, as you're, you're left there to study whatever is going on. Um, and this introduction was written by Bronisław Malinowski in the 1920s um, in one of the founding texts of ethnographic fieldwork, um, the Argonauts of the Western Pacific, Pacific, and he really laid out um, what it means to be an ethnographer or, or the modern ethnography and this kind of heroic myth of the um, individual out in the, in the world trying to understand what's going on. And so a tropical island might not really feel much like the places where we work. This is my library, um, unless of course the plumbing is broken and the heat is broken and we're all of a sudden in a sauna. Um, but I think there's a lot of methodological continuity between these kinds of places, which has to do with ethnographers and ethnography's emphasis on the importance of observing and understanding social practices and interactions. So why would you want to let one of these lunatics loose in your library? Um, and this is Franz Boas, the father of uh, modern anthropology. Um, and I'd like to start by thinking a little bit about the library itself. What exactly are libraries made up of? So first and foremost, libraries are social institutions. Um, and in one of the first ethnographically oriented studies of libraries, the you know, very famous sociologist Pierre Bourdieu and his um, colleague Monique saint Martin um, observed that 38% of the students that they um, talked with were not using any of the tools that was supplied by the library. And this was already a 50-year-old study. Um, and what's really interesting about this study um, and it's in Bordu one of Bordeaux's uh, more minor works, Academic Discourse, is that the findings are almost exactly the same as we find today. Um, you could substitute in a modern library and almost just publish the exact same study. So what else are libraries? Uh, libraries provide spaces for social processes and interaction that go far beyond our collections and services, um, and often their primary uses. And I would argue that that's just fine. And in order to understand the role of the library in the lives of our users, we need to understand how the library fits within these bigger social processes. So libraries are about social relations. They're about social institutions embedded within other social institutions, like universities or elsewhere, and the complex networks of social relationships um, that are represented by these institutions. Libraries are also technologies and technological systems. Uh, libraries contain or, and are themselves made up of symbol, symbols and symbolic systems. And they're also used symbolically by people and institutions as they make them part of their identities. And I would submit that many of the arguments that we have about things like where the book should be shelved or housed, um, library futures, operations, and so forth, are actually operating at the symbolic level. Libraries also represent beliefs about the world and about how information should be organized. And finally, and really importantly, libraries are about practices. They're about people doing things and, and finding the information they need and getting things done as they work through their academic lives and um, their lives in general. And so when we list out these things, social relations, technology, symbols, beliefs, and practices, this starts to sound a lot like what anthropologists talk about when we talk about culture. It starts to sound a lot like the definition we would put forth of culture. 
And so ethnography developed as a discipline, specifically as a way of understanding culture, as the art and science of describing a group, a culture, or a social process. So if we approach libraries as an expression of culture, then all of a sudden the library and the tropical islands start to appear much more methodologically similar. And ethnograph ethnographic approaches can be very usefully applied to both contexts, and really almost any context that involves understanding human behavior in a holistic way. While there are many approaches to conducting ethnographic research, almost all ethnographers share a basic set of methodological approaches. Ethnography seeks to use local categories of analysis as a way of understanding cultural events on their own terms. Ethnography usually involves a long-term engagement with subjects and some period of intense participation and observation. Um, and ethnography seeks to understand both the insider's perspective of a process of social of a process or social event, as well as the analysis um, explanation. We call these the emic and edic um, explanations. And finally, and very importantly, ethnographers are careful to avoid making assumptions about what they will find and suspend judgments about what their subjects are doing. So to summarize then, ethnography is centrally about, about gathering empirical data about real people in real situations. And it's especially useful in explaining questions of why and how processes occur in a way that can very effectively be used to fill gaps um, in information provided by more quantitative approaches. So we often talk about ethnography being hypothesis generating rather than hypothesis testing. So I'd like to pause here for just a moment to draw the distinction between ethnographic methods and ethnography. Ethnographic methods refer to the practices and procedures that researchers use to collect data while ethnography refers to the descriptive or interpretive synthesis um, of this data, the so-called thick description um, of culture, to use a terminology that was developed by Clifford Geertz. And while many disciplines and researchers utilize ethnographic methods, um, not all, and including much of my own work, um, attempt to construct ethnography as an outcome. So let's spend the remainder of my presentation outlining um, some of the methods that make up the ethnographic toolkit. Um, and I'd like to discuss really what you might do with these types of methods rather than um, the specific outcomes or the specific results of this research. Um, so if you're interested in, in results, we'll be hearing much more about um, uh, projects tomorrow, and um, I'd be happy to answer questions during the question and answer time uh, about specific studies. Um, and one of the outcomes of the AROC project that Marilee mentioned was an ethnographic toolkit for use in libraries, and you can download that um, from the website um, as a practical guide. So I'm going to focus on three types uh, of methods. Uh, observational methods, interview methods, and mapping visual methods. And the ways these types of methods can provide insights to the place of the library user, uh, at the place of the library in um, our <coughs> users' lives. And I've connected them together here because the separation is somewhat artificial, and I often utilize these elements in conjunction with each other, and so this is kind of a um, a way of approaching ethnography from several different angles. So just starting out with uh, observation. Direct observation uh, really is the beginning and the heart of ethnographic methods. And we can learn a tremendous amount about how people use our spaces and what takes place in our libraries by simply unobtrusively watching um, what people are doing. Um, and this can be facilitated as well now with cameras or, or other technological means. And we can use these to construct things um, such as heat maps um, of space usage. This is an example from Indiana University's Graduate Commons, which is a dedicated um, study space for graduate students. Um, and by constructing these um, types of maps, we can tell a lot about the social life of a particular space. So in this space, we can clearly see that our workstations can continue to be um, in very high demand. And these are the, the central um, dots in the middle are the workstations. But we can also see the migration of individuals out towards the perimeter um, of this space and away from the collaborative um, or social spaces um, that are provided. And so as you might imagine, this is a very solitary, um, quiet study area and serves a very particular type of student and a very particular um, type of student work. Um, and this is self-enforced within this space. So moving on to um, interview-based methods. Don't often get to 
interview a president. Uh, the first example really is both an observational and an interviewing method. Um, and I call this the research practice interview. And this interview simply asks participants to search for information that they need for an assignment um, or for a research project they're working on. Um, and I've used this from ev everyone from first year undergraduate students all the way through um, tenured faculty. It's a really um, adaptive method. And this can show us in really great detail what's actually happening um, as people are searching for the information they need, where they go, where they start, and how the library um, and the open web are integrated, um, and how people evaluate and, and value the usefulness of the information um, they find. And this really gives us um, a sense of the real life experience of a search for information um, and the fluid borders between the different kinds of online spaces that people are using um, throughout their careers from um, the beginning of the university all the way through um, very advanced research and scholarship. Uh, along similar lines, I've also asked students to map out their practices step by step. And this is an excellent approach for identifying discrete and related activities and to gather details about, this process, about these processes. So for example, this student has mapped out their assignment, their search and discovery process, um, working through evaluating their resources, getting help um, in a very detailed way. Um, and what's important about this type of artifact is not so much that the quality of the drawing or what's in the drawing, but that it can be used as an artifact that can be discussed as an elicitation technique. So one uh, method that I've become really excited about recently um, are different types of ethnographic mapping methods. Um, and I'll spend a little bit more time on um, some of these. Um, the first is something I call cognitive maps, um, and these are also called sketch maps. These are originally developed by um, uh, urban designers, um, urban geographers, um, urban planners, um, to understand how people um, experience the city and how they construct their understanding of their social space. Um, and we found that these are really effective for understanding how uh, students conceptualize the library space, students or, or others conceptualize the library space. Um, and in this particular pro protocol, we ask students to um, change the color of their pen every two minutes. Um, to add a time element in. So we can see what they drew first and second and third. Um, and we put the, a time constraint on this um, so that the most important things to students um, rise to the surface. Um, we've also used this um, to think about the spaces on campus um, and how libraries are integrated um, within uh, those spaces. So as we look at maps like this, these, um, these can be really effective to quickly understand um, how students are conceptualizing their usage of the library. And this is a fairly detailed map. I'll show some less detailed ones in a moment. So as you'd expect, things like computers and lab spaces and so forth, these kinds of places where students can get things done, meet with people, um, are very high um, on the list. And we did find that students were able to understand where they could get help, where they could interact with somebody um, at the public desks but librarians were almost completely absent from these. Um, and so these blank spaces are often more informative um, than the spaces that are drawn. And when something that looked like a person does appear, it's almost always an architectural element. Um, this is a bronze statue that's in the atrium. <laughs> so a little disappointing. <laughs> uh, so here's another um, drawing from this same library. Um, as you can see, the, the commons appear and the collaborative workspaces appear again. And then we have an entire blank space um, in the left-hand side of the library. And so as you might um, guess, this is where uh, periodicals are shelved. So completely <laughs> missing from the perception or conceptualization of this library. Um, and this is one I like to show. I call this the digestive model of the library. <laughs> so the student working through the books, computers, and study areas and finally winding up in the cafe. Um, so we use these to understand the identification um, of elements with the library. And as I've already mentioned, things like the desks, the computers, the study areas, these social spaces are very high um, in identification. And librarians, journals, some of the more tr things we think of as the traditional areas of libraries are really not identified. Um, with students' conceptualization of the libraries. And a lot of, a huge amount of real estate in most libraries is devoted to things that our users are not necessarily um, conceptualizing as part of the library. Um, so a little bit of result. 
Uh, I couldn't resist. Um, so one other um, approach to understanding the way that the library is integrated um, into the lives of um, students and faculty members are constructing uh, what I call day maps. And this is a very simple method that asks students to uh, map out their day um, during a normal uh, academic day um, and to list the places that they go and what they're doing there. Um, and this can either be done uh, via paper or I've started to do this using uh, cell phones and various other technologies. Um, and we can use these to construct um, time allocation charts. And this is a very classical anthropo anthropological technique and it makes for a terrible slide. Um, <clears throat> but what I wanna show from this slide is that we can compare students side by side and really understand interesting things about the different types of students and the different um, universities that these students go to. And so the three on the left are a residential university and the three on the right are a uh, commuter university actually here in Chicago. And so what we can see um, really quickly is this community university, um, the days are punctuated by these yellow times where students are traveling between different spaces. And then the last student, the huge orange bar, is a time when the student is working off campus and not even reachable. So we can use these to really understand uh, where we can meet our students during the course of their day in a very natural way or in a naturalistic way. And we can see the spaces where students enter the libraries. Those are bracketed in red if you can see them, we can see this, the times when students are coming to the library to get something done. And one of the real differences we saw here is that students in the urban setting uh, really only had short periods of time during the day where they had to pop into the library, get something done, and then leave. And residential students had a real luxury of time where they could come and go um, and spend much more sustained um, periods of time studying. Um, so these types of day maps can also be used to um, to um, construct other uh, very interesting and very useful um, maps. Um, and this is an example of um, a student uh, from my university that, we, uh, that recently com completed this project. And this just maps out um, where they've gone um, during the course of the day um, in the city. So we see this student um, has a day that, that involves a, a fairly wide geographic area um, and only kind of passes by the library a couple times. So this student's gonna be very difficult to reach um, if we need to provide some service in the library itself. Um, and then this is a uh, mashup of about 30 students um, in the course of their days, um, all the places they went, and we can model this for times and various other things. Um, but we see clustering around certain parts of campuses and then kind of going off um, into the residential areas. So we can think really about what times and what spaces um, are most appropriate to, to meet our students. Um, so just to um, conclude, uh, we'll hear a lot more uh, examples um, throughout the rest of the day um, and tomorrow um, about uh, ethnographic approaches to the library. Um, and I would like to encourage us to think about uh, what a library ethno ethnology might look like. Um, so ethnology refers to the comparison of cultural traits and practices um, and relationships between them. And I think within the libraries, we've gotten pretty good, um, especially over the, the last few years, as standalone studies. Um, and we've developed a fairly large corpus of ethnographic work um, that we can draw on. But I think as a discipline, we can go quite a bit farther um, in developing opportunities for collaborative and comparative ethnographic work, um, as well as longitudinal depth uh, within this work. Um, and these are two of the key issues that we're presently grappling with um, within our ethnographic programs at uh, Indiana University. Um, and I really do hope that meetings like this um, can help build this community and help build this um, comparative uh, work across uh, many different libraries. And I think we're saving questions till the end. Thank you very much. <laughs>